Hello, can you hear me? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the final keynote of today. Um, my talk will be about making my first contribution to Go. How many of you have actually made a contribution to the Go repository? Just a quick show of hands. All right, quite a number. A few, not too many. Um, right, we'll talk about how I started completely not knowing anything about contributing to Go to how I finally made my first merge. So in April last year, um, I merged the uh, a speaker note support for the present tool. And how many, of, how many of you are familiar with the present tool? OK, cool. So um, don't worry if you don't know anything about it. I'll go over that later. Um, the idea and the entire process of building to, to getting my code reviewed by the Go team to um, finally getting my code merged um, took me about a month. Um, a bit of um, background about me, I picked up programming uh, in 2014. Uh, Go was my first backend language, and I spoke about it at GoFreCon. Um, I, <clears throat> I, I don't come from a CS background. I, I used to practice law, and I taught myself programming outside of law, um, like after office hours. So I had, when I built this, I had zero experience. Um, working with anything remotely like that at all. Um, I didn't know anything about syncing across browsers, sessions. And I also had zero experience with open source contribution. So I didn't know what open source contribution was about. Um, I was completely new to it. I didn't know the tools. I didn't know what Garrett was. But the point is that it's now live. It's live in a Go code base and it's being used by people. So um, speaker note, so what exactly did I build and how exactly does it work? Ah, okay. So um, speaker notes is basically um, a tool for you to, um, to write your presentation um, content in markdown format and then you pass, it, you pass that, that piece, uh, that file to the Go server. The Go server will pass the markdown format for you and then present it nicely to your client uh, in, in a very pretty format. So uh, you basically run present. Now your present server is running. Oh, what is this? Yeah, so, um, so this is how it looks like when you use the present tool. It's similar to Keynote, uh, PowerPoint, except that you run it within the browser. So this is what the Go team built. I believe it was built by Andrew Duran and Rob Pike. Um, and what exactly did I do? So um, I built this support for it. Basically, um, what it didn't have back then was that it didn't have live speaker note support. And you had to rely everything um, on what you had on the main browser window. So uh, I created a second window where you can re uh, refer to your notes, um, look at your control, the, the navigation of the slides entirely from a second window. So you, <clears throat> um, you can navigate from the child window and everything is synced with the parent window. You can also sync from the parent window, and the navigation state is updated on the child window as well. So I built this entirely on top of the uh, present tool. Um, everything is completely synced. If you run like your Go, um, if you try and run uh, compiled Go code, it's also synced with both windows. So let's get back to the slides. Right, so that's what I did. Um, in my presentation, I will go over my thoughts on open source, um, the motivations that led me to building uh, this feature, Oops. the design um, process and approach of building this, uh, a little bit about Garrett and getting my code reviewed, and as well as the Go community. So what is open source? Uh, when I first started programming, I heard the term open source thrown around a lot, and I always wondered, what is open source? Um, so the definition um, in this book called Understanding Open Source and Free Software Licensing is that it's software with, with its source code made available with a license in which the copyright holder provides the rights to study, change, and distribute the software to anyone and for any purpose. So to me back then, I still didn't understand why people put their code online for free, why people contribute to it for free on their own time. Um, to me, um, as a beginner programmer and learning programming, open and source to me was important because it allowed me to refer to other people's code and learn from other people's code. 
So, I, so for that reason alone, I completely supported open source. But as for why people contributed to open source, <clears throat> uh, I had no clue. So I wanted to find out. My initial attempts at contributing um, weren't very fruitful. So it started when uh, someone from the Go team circulated a tweet about contributing to Go. So they basically said, hey, we have a list of Go issues uh, where help is wanted. Um, go to this link, uh, search for the flag, uh, search for issues tagged with um, help wanted. So I did. So basically, uh, just go to, if you go to that link, you'll see a list of issues with help wanted. And then you can pick, um, look at the level of difficulty, um, you know, describe in the issue and pick any issue that you want it to, to work on. So I did. Uh, I, I looked at the issues and I tried to pick the simplest one. I can't remember what it was. I think it had something to do with documentation. And I actually started writing code on it. And I wrote it halfway. And, and, and midway, you know, it suddenly hit me that, you know, actually I didn't know what the maintainers wanted. Um, I, I knew that the issue was described on GitHub and, and I kind of understood the issue, but I wasn't sure if what I was going to work on was going to be what the maintainers had in mind. So I was a little bit intimidated and I just abandoned the code halfway and decided not to, to work on that issue. So um, the, um, another opportunity arose um, with regard to open source contribution was when <coughs> I had breakfast with Hannah Kim uh, and Brad Fitz, who were my fellow speakers at a conference in India in February last year. So I used the present tool. And, um, and after the presentation, we were all talking about the state of pre presentation tools. We're talking about Keynote, PowerPoint, and Go Present. And it came up, and this statement came up, and we said, Present is great, or go present is great, but it does not have speaker note support. So that statement stuck with me um, throughout the conference and, and throughout my flight home uh, as I thought about how this might be implemented. So I just kept, kept thinking like, oh, I, I really wish, like I use present and I really wish present had a tool like that. So, um, and, and how are we gonna build that? Like that was, I, I had zero clue how, how that might work at all. So when I went back uh, to uh, San Francisco, uh, where I'm based, um, I immediately went to uh, conduct some research on whether any work was done on it at all. So a quick Google uh, threw up this uh, tweet. So uh, uh, a gopher apparently said that he hacked the Go Present tool to support speaker notes. Oh, that's interesting. So someone actually did some work on it. <clears throat> and he, he showed like a screenshot of how it works. Uh, and that was in, if you look at the date, it was in June 2014. So that was about two years from when, um, you know, I, I, I started thinking about it. And uh, if you look at what he did, um, what he did was actually to, to display speaker notes uh, at the bottom of uh, your presentation slide, but still contained within the, the main browser window. So you didn't have the, the dual screen <clears throat> um, uh, functionality that, presentations like Keynote or PowerPoint had, in which I wanted, because if you use it this way, then uh, you won't be able to use it in a live presentation. But it was interesting, because he also put the code up, so I thought, <clears throat> okay, maybe this can lead me to somewhere. Like, um, like you know, how exactly did, did he get about doing it? And maybe from there, uh, I'll get a better clue as to how this entire browser syncing thing might work. So <clears throat> he put a code on, online, uh, I read it, uh, it was quite helpful, uh, he, he, he did some uh, JavaScript manipulation. And I asked him, so what happened to it? Uh, did, did you get it merged eventually? And uh, so apparently he did not. Um, he, he, uh, the code was left there, but nothing was merged upstream. So the status was that nobody had basically done any work, uh, I believe. So again, as I said, uh, I wanted zero screen support. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I, I, um, I thought about it, um, thought about how to do it. And one day I met a good friend of mine in San Francisco. He's called Dmitry Shoryayov. Uh, if, if, you know, if, if, you, if you know him, you might know him as someone who is very active in the Go community. He's a very active open source contributor as well. So he asked me one day, like, hey, anything interesting that you're working on? And I said, yeah, like, I just got back from GoForCon India, and, like, I'm thinking about this Go Present tool and thinking about how that might work, you know, and I really want to try and build something for it. I did a bit of research. I, this is what I found, but I still wanted something better. So he's like, oh, um, okay, uh, why don't you look into, like, web sockets that will, uh, that, <clears throat> uh, that, that will help you, um, you know, 
build something like that. Um, and WebSockets uh, at that point was an entirely new um, concept to me. I was still pretty new. Um, but uh, just a brief, so he just left it at, at that. But just uh, for now, just a brief um, overview of how that might work. Right now, uh, when, you, when you run your present server, it opens a WebSocket connection to the client. So what we do now is that we open and uh, <clears throat> we store a session object on the present server. And it stores, and every time you navigate from the parent window, it sends navigation state data to the session object. And clients and multiple clients can connect to it. Uh, yeah, you pass navigation state inside, and multiple clients can connect to the present server uh, and do whatever you want uh, with the navigation state. So that's how that might have worked with WebSockets. Um, but I arrived, I eventually arrived at a completely different approach. Um, he said, Dimitri just mentioned WebSockets, and I just put it at the back of my mind. It sounded like a lot of work. Um, because I remembered something else uh, that I had seen before, and I wanted to investigate that. So um, I'll now go through like, the entire process of how I arrived at a completely different uh, approach. Um, the first step <clears throat> was that I definitely knew it could be done. And that was very, very important to me for somebody who didn't know anything about uh, building something like that. So I remember using Google Slides before. And Google Slides is similar to the present tool. Um, it also runs in a browser, <coughs> um, except that it doesn't parse your content in Markdown format. It's basically just PowerPoint running in a browser. But the cool thing about it is that when you enter presentation mode, there's, an, there's a new window that pops up. And this window. Um, contains your speaker notes, and you can control the navigation from within this trial window, which forms like basically your control window during a live uh, speaker um, <clears throat> presentation. So to me, that was very important, because now that I knew that it could be done, you know, it motivated me to, to keep on going and search for a solution uh, to fixing this problem. So I just want to bring, uh, bring up a story um, uh, as told by a programmer named Michael Rebresh. So um, he has told a story of how uh, he was once optimizing an inner loop, uh, and he was asking a friend for help. And that friend stayed long in the office and at night left a message for Abresh, telling him that he had gotten two more instructions out of the seemingly optimal inner loop. And Abresh didn't think that was possible, but before the friend came into, the, into work the next day, Abresh had already found out how to reduce the loop by one instruction. And very interestingly, at that point, that friend told him that uh, he had actually made a mistake and um, the two-cycle optimization wasn't valid. But the important thing is that just the thought that the friend could have gotten two more instructions out of the loop made it possible for Abresh to find another optimization. So he said that, um, I was sure I had an optimal enough solution, but just believing that someone had a better solution than me um, allowed me to break through my preconceptions and do something I thought was impossible. So the point I'm trying to make here is that for somebody who, who, who started off not knowing anything or, or, or for somebody who has never done anything remotely like that, just knowing that it could be done um, really gave me that motivation to keep pressing in for a solution to, uh, to this problem. And I think that's the beauty about programming, you know. Um, you, you, um, you come to this problem not knowing how it might be solved, but because you know that it can be done, things that you thought were impossible, um, <clears throat> you know, are just invalid, and you just keep on going to find that solution. So now that I was satisfied that it could be done, the next step was to create a window, just like what Google Slides did. <laughs> so it was just a simple JavaScript uh, call to opening a child window, uh, just a simple one-liner in the code. And the next step was to look uh, into the JavaScript code to find out where to put the key press listener. So if you press N, the child window will pop up. And this is where I inserted it. So it was just like just looking through the code. Um, so the next step was that it should look the same, obviously. So I started, <clears throat> so I started um, trying to copy the CSS and JavaScript, uh, like just duplicating the file and trying to, to to fix things up on my own so that it could look like Google Slides, you know, like slides on the left and then like main slide on the right so that you can do a preview of the before and after slide. So, um, so uh, I tried doing that and like after a while, it just felt like a lot of work and it just wasn't working um, very nicely. So, and then it hit me um, that, 
you know, since Present runs in the browser, I could just import the contents via an iframe. So it's so, it's, it's so simple. Just, just <clears throat> create an iframe and reference the parent, the, the browser window URL. Because, um, yeah, it's just like, <laughs> it's just running localhost with port 3999. And then you, have, you immediately have your, um, your contents and layout of uh, present of, of the present slides, uh, copy it onto your child window, and um, the use of this iframe was very very important uh, in arriving at the complete result. I will get to that later. So this is how it looked like. Um, basically, uh, I took advantage of it was is really you know co coming new and fresh into this project. It was just basically making use of the strengths and advantages of present. And just, get, and just being so lazy and, uh, and using all the strengths so that I could write as little code as possible. So the first step was importing it via an iframe with the Windows URL. And the second was that because the Go team had already designed the present slides to have like a, like a little preview of the before and after slides, so I could just copy that layout as well. So if you control it via the uh, control window or the child window, you know, it kind of gives you like a slight preview of the before and after slide. So that's like, that's like just basically using what the Go team already had and not doing any extra work. So um, base, so the step four. Um, now that I had data um, looking exactly the same on both slides, the next step was to make synchronization possible. So if you navigate from one slide to the other on any of those windows, the navigation state had to be completely synchronized. So how did I do that? Um, I looked for uh, solutions online, and these, these technologies came up. You could um, basically communicate across browser sessions with cookies, post message, uh, local storage. Um, post message was an idea that came up later, like during the code review, and it's something that I'll get to later as well. Um, I settled on local storage because <clears throat> uh, it, like, like it seemed like an appropriate choice. It was more flexible, um, and it allowed me to write less code. Uh, for this purpose. So a bit about local storage and how it works. Um, it allows you to store, local storage allows you to store um, data in your browser that is accessible by um, multiple, um, uh, by instances of the same session. So local storage is similar to session storage. Um, either one would have, would have worked, but I wanted to use local storage because it allowed me to control um, the expiry of the values. Like with session storage, they expire your values um, once you close the session. But with local storage, you, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to, to manipulate the, the values and control it on my own. So the important thing about local storage is, is that it's accessible across browser sessions. So this is, like, this is kind of like similar to the um, approach that WebSockets would have taken. Um, with WebSockets, you kind of store the navigation state um, in a session object uh, in your server. Um, and uh, with local storage, you store that navigation state as well, except that you store it on the client. Uh, and you don't have to do a round trip to the back end to, to, to store your data. So this is kind of like light, the light away version of storing uh, your navigation state in a session object. Um, so uh, importantly, any change in your local storage is received by event listeners. So what I did with this was that every time you navigate uh, your slide, um, the value of your current slide will increase by one, and it, will, and it will be reflected in local search. And once that change is detected, um, uh, any event listeners that are attached to local search will be picked up by the receiver. And then you can like basically, so that's how you listen out for any changes in navigation state. So um, it very, very importantly, uh, the session itself that's firing off the local storage change, i.e. Um, your control window, um, if you're firing off from <clears throat> uh, a child window and that becomes like the session that's firing off the change, that session itself does not receive the, the event. So even if you attach event listeners uh, to the child window and the child window itself is the one that's firing off the event, it's not the child window who's going to detect any change at all. It's, it's always the other uh, browser sessions that are not the fires. So that was, that's important, and I will go on to illustrate why. 
So again, the GOAL server passes your markdown file, organizes it into a session struct, it passes that data over to the parent window, and the JavaScript client just basically like handles it and decides what to do with it. <coughs> and again, the child window that I created imports everything that the parent window has by, uh, by virtue of an iframe. So, uh, so it, and it's not even a duplication, it's just the exact same HTML CSS file that's running by virtue of an iframe. So just imagine this. The parent window um, uh, contains these slides. The child window imports this via an iframe. Everything is the same. The only difference is that notes, uh, there was an additional notes.js that I had to add in order to manipulate things like where to show your speaker notes uh, and how to align um, the, and, and how to listen to the correct key press um, events and how to lay out the, um, the iframes. So things like that. Uh, and so this is how it works. Uh, there was a slide, there was an existing slides.js file that was running uh, in, uh, in the parent window, in the main browser window, that manages things like navigation, uh, sliding your slides, um, yeah, basically mainly navigation. Um, and all I did was just put in lo a local storage event listener uh, to slides.js, uh, and I needed to do it only once. And this local storage event listener is not even aware that it's sending messages to the child or the parent. It doesn't even know who it's sending to, because uh, whatever it is, the receiving window that receives the data um, is the one that's not the firewall. So if, so, um, and that way it's, uh, it synchronizes, like it goes on an autopilot like synchronization just by putting local storage event listeners. It just handles the technology, just handles everything for you. And it's just, just a very simple, like just put the local storage event listener there. And that's how it's synchronized. So um, once again, uh, for example, just to illustrate, uh, if the child, if the parent is the sender window and it changes the value of current slide because you navigate from it, then the child, the receiving window that runs the exact same slides.js and has like the exact same local storage code, um, picks that up and then it like handles it. And uh, vice versa, if the child becomes the sender window, it is the parents, it's the parent that picks up the local storage change. So it's just in, uh, the code basically looks like this. It's just basically adding an event listener for a local storage change events. Um, and then you update that window by comparing uh, to see if there is any change in the current and the destination slide. Um, yeah, by virtue of navigation. Just a quick round up. Um, WebSockets would have needed to make a round trip. More code, more work. With local storage, with the local storage approach, um, everything was handled by, is, I mean, the synchronization is handled by JavaScript. Uh, less code, less work. Uh, make, you make use of um, Present's advantages and strengths. Uh, you reuse the front end code in Present. It is neater that way. And it also takes advantage of the in browser design uh, of the Go Present tool by calling, by pulling it via an iframe. So now that I had, uh, prototype working, I got it working within a day, but while I was working on it, um, you know, it all seemed very daunting to me. It's like, um, it, um, at every step of the process, like, it, it just seemed like, you know, like, I still didn't know how to do it, but, but I got to it um, by breaking all, all, like, this process down into smaller steps. So I told, so I went back to Dimitri, I said, hey, Dimitri, I have, like, a prototype working now, would you like to see it? So he took a look at it, and, um, and, and, and he took a look at my code, and he's like, so where's the synchronization? And I said, uh, oh, it's in local storage. Uh, so he was like, wow, uh, that's, that's cool. Um, and I told him, um, you know, I think, uh, what do you think if I, if I tried to merge this upstream? Like, I think people um, might be interested in using this, and people who use the present tool might find having live speaker note support useful. So he's like, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's, um, you know, why didn't you do that? So he said, um, so he told me, so he basically was very helpful in guiding me uh, throughout the whole process. Um, he just told me, oh, first step, open a GitHub issue um, in order to tell the reviewers or the Go team that you have something working and then demonstrate that uh, how it works, demonstrate the code for it. 
And so this is what I did. This was the actual issue that I submitted. Um, it's really basically, um, so, so like some of the, the logistical steps that you uh, should, that you can bear in mind is that when you start off your issue title, just preface your proposal title with the words proposal, if you're proposing something new, um, and then write out the directory name. And in this case, I was affecting uh, command present. So I put that in the title as well in a short description of the issue. Uh, I also recorded a demonstration of how it works. So it's like a, a, like a quick online video of how it works, just to make it clear to the reviewers. I also linked to actual working code on GitHub, so the reviewers uh, would know that I have working code for it. So throughout all this process, um, Dimitri, who is already an active contributor to Go, um, he gave me very good feedback and guidance. And that kind of like helped me um, in my initial step uh, from not knowing how to contribute to kind of like finally getting it and understanding the process. Okay, interestingly, when I opened the issue, um, uh, it turns out that a similar issue had been opened before. I think it was last year. So it was Andrew Duran, a member of the Go team, who opened this issue. So he says that it has been expressed by Matt, uh, who's in the audience, uh, I believe, and by others, uh, that it would be nice to have a keynote-style multi-display support, and a second display would show speaker note support in the upcoming slide. <coughs> so he sees it, Rob Pike. And <laughs> Rob Pike said that he never wanted this, but he understands the desire. Um, yeah, I believe that Russ Cox has done something like that already. So when I read that, I'm like, okay. <laughs> Um, and then I guess it kind of got like shut down, not shut down, but it froze and like things didn't move uh, after that, 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 you know, uh, discussion. So Matt said, uh, I know a couple of people who didn't use present because they needed the notes in shame because there's something neat about go from for presentations. So I kind of just froze. Uh, that was like, I think about six or seven months before I opened this, is this issue. Yeah. Well, but I think it was because, I mean, I guess it helped that there was an issue open previously and now I, I open up another issue like entirely independently um, and, and I had a, like a working solution. I had uh, like, um, I tried to be really clear about how it works. I had the demo and everything and I tried to keep the code as small as possible. So, oh, well, eventually Andrew said that he thinks that the general approach looks fine. Uh, which is kind of like an okay um, to this proposal. He sees it, uh, Rob Pike as well. Um, yeah, so this time Rob Pike seemed okay with it, like no strong objections. So that was kind of like a go ahead, you know, to continue working on it because uh, Andrew su uh, continued to suggest like a bunch of improvements uh, to it. And so I took it and I, I worked on it. Um, so that was, um, that all came up when I opened the issue. So, um, so I spent like, um, <clears throat> like a, uh, a bit more time to incorporate his, his, his changes. And once I was quite happy with my code, uh, I submitted a change <clears throat> to the Go uh, repository. So contributing to Go is, um, is actually not as difficult. Like, I mean, the, the, the steps are not as complicated. Um, you can look at this link uh, on top for like, a, a, like more detailed steps as to how to proceed. But it's basically signing the contributor license agreement and then downloading the git curl review command tool. Um, and then basically the, 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 the steps are similar to your normal git flow, just git add and git change, which is equivalent to git commit. Um, git mail uh, to submit a pull request. And then your code appears on this uh, code review tool called uh, Garrett. So it basically looks like that. Uh, and then like <coughs> uh, reviews will basically start like reviewing your, um, your code. So, um, all was well and good. I was getting my code reviewed by the Go team and I was learning a lot from them. <laughs> like the, the reviews were like really high quality and like uh, I, I learned a lot from them. Um, but very interestingly, uh, midway through the review, um, Andrew brought in another reviewer from the Go team called Chris and Chris suggested <clears throat> a completely different uh, technology um, to what I had proposed, which would mean that I had to overhaul like what I did entirely. Like <clears throat> I can't even retain like much of it because because it would um, yeah it would change a lot of the implementation. It would change a lot of the code. They basically said uh, suggested 
to use post message to communicate between the windows and iframes instead of using local storage uh, with the listeners. And <clears throat> with post message, so, so post message is a JavaScript technology that, uh, that you normally use uh, to communicate between like iframes and like browser windows. And one of its advantages is that it allows for like cross origin communication. But in this case, I thought like we didn't need it. So I went back to Chris <clears throat> and, and I asked like, you know, like why do we have to do this? <clears throat> and, um, and, and Andrew then stated his reasons why he thought post message was a better, um, a better solution. So, uh, so I took it uh, and I took like the next three days to work on it, um, to work on this, on trying out this new uh, approach. And, um, and, and yeah, it was just, I, 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 I worked on it like sincerely for the next three days, but I couldn't even get it to work. Um, the thing about post message is that unlike local storage, uh, you had to be mindful of which frame or which window you were sending a message to. So if you were sending via the parent to the child's iframe, you had to say, okay, um, I want you to send this message to that iframe. And if you're controlling it from the iframe, you have to say, oh, I want to send it to the parent window. So there's a lot more code. Um, there was a bit of complexity, um, and I couldn't do that window agnostic thing that I could do with local storage. So, <clears throat> um, so I just thought that, I still thought that local storage was a better approach. Um, so I, I went to Dimitri and I said, um, so like, I'm getting my code reviewed by the Go team, and this is what the Go team came back to me and, and said, and they, they suggested a completely different approach. And I tried, like, I, I, like, uh, I tried to implement this in the code and I just couldn't get it to work. Like, what should I do? And then <clears throat> Dimitri just came back to me and he said, you know, like sometimes, um, sometimes you come up with a solution and you get it working and, and you think like it's great. And then, um, and then more experienced reviewers come back to you and tell you uh, and suggest or recommend to you a completely di different approach. And then you take it and you try it and you, you still think that it, it doesn't work. And that's okay. Like you can still go back to them and tell them what you have done and the reasons why you think um, your original solution works better. And yeah, you just have to state your reasons. So okay, cool. So I went back to them, um, listed out like the various reasons, what I did, what I tried, why I thought um, the original approach was better. And <clears throat> um, and Andrew uh, finally was satisfied with my rationale, uh, and so was Chris. Uh, and then I got, uh, so we stuck with the original approach. Um, and uh, yeah, so Chris, uh, Chris and Andrew continued reviewing my code, uh, approved it, and I finally got it merged. And one interesting uh, experience that came out from this review was that um, I was actually quite glad that Rob Pike bought it to look at my code. So this was kind of like the icing on, my, like, like on the cake, you know, like. He didn't have to because Chris and Andrew had already approved it, and um, and that was enough to get the code merged. But then Rob Pike like later on came in and asked like for like the location of the code and like where uh, like where like yeah and some questions. He looked at it, basically gave me a look good to me. So that was like, I mean yeah for like a new programmer like me that was like really really awesome. That was a nice thing on, on the kick. So a uh, quick comparison for lo uh, between local storage and post message. Uh, very simply, for me, I got local storage to work. I couldn't get post message to work. Um, local storage was window agnostic. Um, I could use the same JavaScript code uh, and let the communication be handled by the local storage technology itself. With post message, I couldn't reuse the JavaScript code. Yep. So it's just like a quick roundup. Yep. And then, then it finally got merged. Um, and it's now live. You can, if you download the latest present tool, you can try it out yourself. Um, so community, um, the community was, uh, the Go community was uh, important in, in helping like a, it's sort of like being welcoming of a new programmer like me um, into making my first contribution. Like, first of all, I, I didn't feel like I was, um, unwelcome in making my first contribution. In fact, the Go team was very, very patient when they um, reviewed my code. Um, so first, uh, first up, uh, Dimitri Shoryov uh, was very, very helpful in 
getting me acquainted with the process of contributing um, online. It was encouraging as well. <clears throat> um, Andrew Duran was, was really, really uh, kind uh, and very welcoming. Um, I mean, very, very simple actions like sending me an, an email to a short email, you know, telling me what I should be looking out for when I make my first contribution. All these things are, they, I think they make a difference uh, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, it just made the atmosphere really welcoming. Uh, Chris as well. Um, I mean, I, I had like, I, I just had a really good experience uh, getting my code reviewed by them. And like, I felt like I learned a lot and uh, felt welcome contributing. Rob Pike for bothering to look at my code um, and for allowing my change to be added onto the work that they did. Um, that was really awesome. So um, at the beginning, I talked about um, my thoughts about open source and what open source was about, um, how I didn't understand it. But at the end of it, um, I kind of like got a better idea of what it was about. Um, and I want to bring you to a code by another programmer called Linus, Linus Torvalds. So he said, uh, when asked about um, open source contributions, he said that that is worth celebrating. Uh, the constant individual struggle to improve your own standing. The little selfish person who tries to take advantage of everybody else by making the minimal possible outlay, preferably by using mostly the source code that somebody else has done and incrementally improving it with relatively small effort. That was kind of what I did. Like, I, I built a feature on top of the um, present tool um, that I wanted to use. And then later on, somebody made a change uh, to what to, to the feature that I built and, and kind of like just work on top of what people, like somebody else has worked on. And so for a while, that person gains an advantage because now the tool did what he wanted. And in the longer term, we all gain that knowledge. Uh, one small and meaningless advantage at a time and it just builds up and up. And so in many ways, I think the real idea of open source is for it to allow everybody to be selfish. Um, not about trying to get everybody to contribute to some common good. And these reasons doesn't have to be financial. Um, they tended, for him, it tended to be centered around uh, just the pleasure of tinkering. And that was why he did uh, Linux. Uh, programming was his passion, his hobby, and really learning how to control the hardware was his own selfish goal. So um, having contributed to, um, I mean, a, a small part to the Go tooling, the Go repository. Um, I felt like I was, yeah, like part of something bigger, seeing my code as part of an open source repo and knowing that it will be used by others. It's, it's quite a nice feeling. And um, I'm glad to have experienced what it's like to be part of open source. And it happened because I was motivated by the desire to see something that was built, uh, to see something built on top of what I used um, sometimes. And uh, so <clears throat> I was motivated both by the desire to have this feature and the thrill of uh, figuring out how this might be built for me. And also what I want to say um, through this presentation is that sometimes approaching a problem without any preconceived ideas of how to resolve it can lead you to a solution that works. I built the note support uh, by examining the problem without knowing how I might build it uh, and without any baggage of preconceived ideas. And for me, um, working on this project was just taking a step uh, one at a time. I, needed, I knew I needed a child window, so I built one. And then I needed to copy the data, so I imported it via an iframe. And I needed to synchronize communication, so I searched for a way to do it, and I implemented that. So it was a step-by-step -step process, and each step of the way, um, if I felt like I was going in the right direction, I continued going. Um, so. Um, yeah, if you ever feel like you don't have experience to build something, just remember that the right approach, uh, armed with curiosity, um, is, is all you really need to build this. And, you know, it's basically approaching a problem with a beginner's mind and figuring things out, seeing each problem with a fresh attitude and mind. So um, the end result that I arrived at from not knowing anything and perceiving how difficult it might be to get something to work, uh, to eventually arriving at some working prototype was immensely satisfying. To me, the icing on the cake was having the Go team review my code, Rob Pike taking time to look at my code and giving me a looks good to me, uh, seeing my add-on feature on a live copy used and appreciated by others. Uh, it was all worth it. 
Um, and I struggled with knowing how to contribute uh, initially, but uh, landing on an area um, that you want to see fixed or improved came naturally for me, and it can only come about if you use the tool uh, regularly um, so that you know which areas need to be improved. So um, if, if you're curious about contributing to Go, I guess um, if, you, if you use more of Go, um, running into areas that need fixing and contributing will then come naturally. So yeah, that's all from the presentation today. Thank you, and thank you, Golang, for having, uh, Golang UK for having me.